Hey guys and welcome back. I'm Rachel O'Leary and this past week and I had the great opportunity to go see a friend of mine, Corey Hopkins from Texas, do a master aquascaping class at Brooklyn Hardscape. Now I think it's a really exceptional idea to attend presentations like this because you learn a lot of really cool tips. Because this is such a long video, I'm going to put timestamps down in the comments section for the different parts of his demo from planting to filtration so that you guys can skip around and see what you would like. Um, as always, thanks for your support and I hope you enjoy the content. I will also put links to Corey's various social medias down there as well. So make sure you guys stop by his pages and give him some love. And as always, tag me in your recent projects around your yard or fish room so that I can... Uh, enjoy those as well on Instagram. Without further ado, let's get on to the aquascaping demo. I hope you guys enjoy it. So why don't you tell us how you got started with aquascaping and when it went from like being something that you added for your fish to becoming more of a dedicated art form. Um, so it all really started as far as the aquascaping thing was uh, me being a bass fisherman and uh, wanting to learn uh, the plants that the bass are hanging around, and um, so what I did is just did a Google search, of course, and I looked up aquatic plants that bass hang around or that fish hang around, and then um, from there in the Google images part, I see a bunch of mono tanks, and then from there I'm like, okay, this is amazing, and I had no idea that it was ever here, that it was ever you know, a tank. So uh, from there, I went to YouTube and um, went to the, I think it was the Green Machines. Oh, YouTube. yeah. And from there, it, I just fell in love. I'm like, holy crap, this is amazing. You know, it was just, yeah, the, the videos are set up really well for beginners, and, you know, just to see like how things go. And I um, was really impressed by that. So from there, I got a 20 long and then um, started aquascaping, just learning from the community. So you were more of an aquascaper from the beginning, not a fish guy first? Or do you consider guy. yourself a fish guy first? I was a fish guy because uh, I kept fish since I was eight years old. And then uh, for the past five years, I've been doing straight aquascaping. Okay. So, but you know, the first, I think year, year or so, I, I did a lot of learning about how to grow plants and things like that. And then um, from there, just befriending people that are much better than me and um, learning from those guys. So basically how it started and then it was just over. Had to do it. Had to. So. But then, you know, just my love for fish and aquariums grew even more since then. Well, I've always known you as a fish guy because you appreciate a lot of the same yeah. fish that I appreciate. So. For me personally, when I see an aquascaper that really takes into consideration what they're creating and then choosing a fish that will really benefit, appreciate, and display well in it, I think that's a place where you really shine. Thank you, I appreciate that. That's a big focus of mine now is, uh, I mean, in the beginning, what is it? What are these for? They're for fish, right? They're for inhabitants, so why not make their life even better? Than as enriched as possible. Exactly, right? Well, I mean, might as well do that, and uh, then you get to see those fish behaving so natural, just like how they would in the wild. Or Better coloration, more coloration. natural behaviors, potential spawning, interaction with your decor. It's yep. all a it's all, beautiful that's synergy. That's what I just, you know, really fell in love with that, you know, uh, with the aspect of aquascaping, and then I get into biotopes and things like that. And, uh, do you want tags taken off? I can do that for you. You can detag for me. Oop, sorry about that. Corey smash. Corey smash. What kind of rock is that? It's a petrified wood. Mm. Those are a lot bigger pieces than I have. They're nice. Yeah, from uh, this company, SR Square Racing. Oh, yeah. You those guys? Yeah. Are you going to be uh, using sand in the front or is it going to be off planes? Yeah, probably use sand. Okay. What do you think of the planes? Um, I don't know exactly until I get to it. I know some, some ferns for sure. Um, 
But yeah. So that's one thing that I usually try to figure out towards the end, just because uh, I don't want things to hinder anything that I happen to be doing at that mm -hmm. point in time. Like, oh well, I wanted to use that plane there. Now I can't. I mean, that's, uh, that's bullshit. So. so this is kind of just a one-to-one -one scale here. It's going to be uh, like kind of this is nature style. Um, nice artistic, flowy, it's a cool wood, and. Um, Yeah, so uh, one thing that I like to do is this tension here, also here, that's not exactly directional. So uh, I'm doing, you know, I have this here, then go over this way, and it goes the opposite way, which is uh, a lot of people do add tension like that. Um, and I think that it really balances out something, or it balances out your aquascape when you add some decent tension to it. Not too much. Good. Another thing that I really uh, take into consideration are the reflections on the side. If you look over here, notice how when you look at this reflection, you can see that it mirrors it, obviously, but then it's a triangle. Triangles are big deals when it comes to this kind of stuff. So, um, and then also here, since it's above, the water line, it's going to reflect above as well, so it looks really nice. Um, same with just about everything here except for that last piece, but um, reflections are bland. Yeah. So it's one thing that I really focus a lot on, are reflections. And I've learned to do that over the years. Okay, so I'm going to add more. is uh, always good to uh, utilize the entire plane of the aquarium. So it's not just like a flat thing. When you you know when you're looking at it straightforward, it works best uh, like this. And you can see it from all angles. Of course, it's going to work best as a flat. But here we're looking at it from the front, so we need to bank it up so we can utilize all the plane to be able to see them from straight up, straight forward. I'm trying to get this a little closer. Okay, so um, normally you wouldn't want this kind of straight lines in here, so that's a good place to uh, shove plants and such to cover that stuff up. So never worry about that. And also, when you're doing rocks, you want to make sure that, um, not always, but you kind of want to make it seem like one rock structure if it's you know, more than just one or two stones or something that's been there for a long time. It's always important to do that. Okay. Man, the stone sure is nice. A lot of times I do a lot of my escaping through the lens of a camera. Um, just so I can see you know, everything that I do is going to be photographed. As well as everything being in the back, you kind of want some stuff to be forward as well. That gives us a sense of depth. Um, shadows are a big deal. Shadows manipulating light. Um, the shadows up front, 
And then brighter in the back is going to give the, the illusion of depth, um, or the feel of depth, however you want to say it. So, um, shadows are a big deal. And how you can do that is, you know, the light just literally comes from straight down. You just lean forward and you can add a shadow. So, um, another thing is a uh, triangular type. This is, I would consider this kind of a triangular style composition. And um, triangles are a big deal when it comes to uh, scaping, or in my opinion at least. Um, it is a simple aspect, but it does work really well when you're off of scaping. Um, always try to get as much in a triangle as you possibly can, uh, meaning create triangles within your um, aquascape. And uh, it's just a, it's a, good, a basic rule of, I don't know, nature, odd numbers, a triangle, it's, it's everywhere. So, um, so I like to uh, focus a lot on that when I'm doing my aquascapes. I'm going to talk about the tank and the light. Yeah, uh, so was this a 90L? 90L, yeah. A UNS 90L and a uh, UNS Titan. Yep. Pretty sweet setup. Uh, contrast oil, UNS contrast oil as well. Feedback back around. It's pretty cool. I really like this shallow tank. I really do a lot with it. Just an experiment. See what happens. Also, keeping your stone and uh, wood in different planes will help uh, make your layout more seem more interesting uh, because not everything's like a layer, you know, a layer of rock, a layer of stone, and a layer of plants. We don't want to layer it too much. We want to utilize our planes as much as possible. It's another reason why we bank the substrate up. And again, I like this piece, but it's just not doing it for me. Actually, looks great. I like it better, like you just put it. Yeah? Yes, the way you flip it over looks much better. Okay. So the rest are probably be plants. I like this little area down here for like a little cave for fish to hide. That was, that's my thing. I love it. Love making little caves and little areas. And like this little hole right here is perfect for fish. For the hole in this one that they'd like to go through too. So if I was a fish, I was living here, hardcore. I feel like there's something, there needs to be something here, but you know, instead of just gonna be like Japan, you can also go by doing it. So. Oh, yeah, it's a little high, though. Um, we can lower it. No, it's okay. It's uh, a yeah. little annoying. Clippers are soft. Now. Are you concerned that this wood is going to fall off when you start to glue it? Yeah, yeah, I'm going to glue it. Mm -hmm. I'm going to glue it all together. Glue it all to these stones here. And um, yeah, I would. Super glue? Yeah, super glue. I feel like I'm getting like a personal demo here, Corey. You are. All for you, Enrique.
Yes, the Supernaturals. The Ogre? Yeah. yeah, I yeah. love their sands. I oh, use yeah. a lot of them as well. So they just blend so nicely. Yeah. What are they called? Supernaturals is the line of these particular substrates. They have a bunch of different um, okay. sort of loose biotope. They're carob seed. Oh, carob seed. Yeah, yeah okay. so they have a bunch of like loose biotope style sands you can buy um, that I particularly like. They also have really nice, small, uh, fine millimeter smooth gravel, which is great for when you're doing more of the river setup and you need to have that the gradation the, of substrate. That's the Sarah, smooth gravel. Oh, that's the Sarah yeah. that he has now? Yeah. Yeah. So it's a carob sea base and then we put them um, out of the ochre sand. Right. So like we're just going to mix it a little bit. It looks I, really nice. I haven't played around with any of the Sarah's, um, their little gravel, other than the anther site, which I particularly yeah. like. No, this is, I'll get the, the thing. Okay. Yeah. I guess it's time for planting when I add a little more substrate back there. That looks awesome. I really love that, that mixture. It's it really ties in nicely to the color of the yeah. stone. Are you just going to do all ferns, you say? Yep. I don't know all ferns. I'll do all ferns. Find some Anubias. I know it's awesome. What is that? So right now you're using more of that polyester fiber and super glue to adhere the various structures together? Yes, exactly what I'm doing. That'll, uh, the little polyfill here is going to act kind of a mortar. And um, of course the super glue holds it all together. And you find that just that little bit of the polyfill and the glue is enough to keep that wood down when you fill it? Yeah, I'll probably have Do you have to, to have a lot in. of connection points? You just gotta have uh, enough to really hold it. So like if there's uh, like something right here, I would do this, but I'd do it behind here. Okay. So I connect it there. Um, and then you know, some of this stuff I'm just gonna like uh, glue together, and like, you know, some of the wood I'm just going to glue to itself, then it'll be held down by like this piece of rock and all the other rock. I've never used this, this polyfill technique. Not that often that I say that. But it's, uh, it's not a new method to the world. I mean, when we say they call it the Indo method, that's what it's been dubbed here in the state at least. Uh, it came from the Indonesian guys. That's very I clever. I forgot this is the last bag of it. Look. This little, little little cigarette filter. Um, Probably a better connection than the, the polyfill. Yeah, like, I don't want the polyfill actually. This is my first time using polyfill doing this. Oh, it is? Yeah. Well, I don't want like it. But I use this on that or even on cotton balls. Yeah. It's fine. I mean, I've cut up little pieces of polystyrene <coughs> yeah. and used those as the contact point. Mm hmm. Yeah. See, I'm all about the. Uh... I feel like I have way more control. This is an excellent pro tip. So, these instead you can coat with the glue and then fit them in between the rock and the wood, and you get a much more consistent contact point. Exactly. You gotta make sure to take the. You gotta make sure to take the the paper off and fluff it. So you can stick it under there. But see how fine it is? It really soaks up that glue. That's fantastic. Yeah. Thank you. And then if you want to cover it up, you can put some sand or even crush off the soil. Is what I use a lot. Uh, okay. I think it's really important for people to come to demonstrations like this and for various shops and stores to have demonstrations like that. this because a lot of these little tips um, or techniques that a lot of the people who are more experienced take from, for granted. Uh, they're just not as intuitive. I agree. And the best way to learn this stuff is to go and see the people that you want to learn from actually do their craft. So I'd really encourage everyone when possible to to attend these sorts of events or encourage your local stores to have out guest aquascapers in order to show these techniques.
bring that up real close so you notice once you add once you add the super glue and the fine copper you'll notice that it smokes yeah i saw that actually so it smokes because of the chemical reaction don't breathe it in obviously and do it in a well ventilated area but it's not going to kill you or anything it's just you know it is what it is see and then something like that you can just cover with some type of uh, yeah sand. sprinkle some sand or crushed soil mm -hmm. i would go probably are you going to do sand in this case i'll because, do sand in this yeah. case but that right there is literally concrete that's all that's Hardness. fantastic yeah. Hey, if, would you would you mind when you're going to plant if you would say what each plant is? Yeah, sure. I'll do that. That'd be great. Thank you. No problem. All right, so this one's a uh, cypress alfuri. I'm going to put this in this back corner here. And what this is going to do is going to grow over like this and give us a really nice canopy, perfect for fish hiding under, and uh, especially like you know. You can do this on a larger scale and like ambush predators and stuff will hang out under there. And, uh, Makes me think of that tank of Jason Balabans where they both meet exactly, in the middle. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, that's an incredible aquarium. It really is. So also, I pick, I pick plants um, with fish in mind as well. So I escape with fish in mind and I pick plants with fish in mind. Do you find that most often you utilize plants that are more nutrient demanding or or more middle of the ground or less nutrient demanding? Um, that kind of depends on the scape itself. So if I'm doing something that's going to be colorful and such, so obviously that's going to require, uh, nutrients. require quite a bit. Um, but something like an all green tank like we're doing here, except for one little pop of this color here, um, we we'll definitely go with you know, low demanding stuff, like what I'm using now, so. And this is a good substrate, so this stuff will just take hold and do its thing. And again, that's that Altum. This is the Altum Contra soil, yeah. Yeah. Even that's Contra soil. I thought it was interesting that it said on the bag that it was um, pH and cage buffering but also released ammonia, or was limited ammonia release? You kind of want a little bit of ammonia when you're setting up a tank. Well, of course, yeah. but it, it seems different from a lot of other products in that a lot of the marketed humate type soils um, are useful because they reduce the carbonate, or the, the hardness, yeah. rather than buffering. So it, it seems like a pretty neat product. That's interesting. There's, I've never heard of those. There's so many different soils now. Like you really have to read the labels. You can get uh, so many options. I'm, I'm constantly in a state of like... Well, I mean, I'm just saying, for right. instance, um, for many years it's been said that if you utilize something like uh, ADA Amazonia, it will provide a more neutral environment. So, for yes, instance, for months. shrimp keepers, it's a useful way to if you have sort of middle of the road type water to be able to provide a more neutral environment in order to keep some of the caradina species this one at least from the packaging and i must be fully clear here and that i haven't used any of these products yet it's interesting that it says it has buffers which i think in in my brain in my science brain it sounds awesome because it means it's going to be more consistent stability but it seems like a lot of the soils um don't necessarily do the same thing. I think it's um, it's trying to be a, um, a little more universal as well. Like I find that I mean, a lot of people use ADA soil, but I don't. I hear so many horror stories with shrimp and other like delicate animals. Uh, with the contra soil, it's less nutrients heavy. It's, it's, it's just trident. Job of uh, it's the narrow leaf. No, that's a trident. It's trident. Oh, that's trident. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I didn't see the little tridents there. Yeah. Very cute. It's like uh, three quarters of the way converting from a pot. Yeah, And just being able to, like I like to say, and Kevin has said this as well, planning to capacity or planning to oh, expectation yeah. Yeah. is a really smart way to have more success with your plan of the aquarium because the more plants you have, the more nutrients they're using, 
and the less likelihood for algae to get its absolute foothold. So investing in more mature plants, or at least plants that have a really significant rootstock or leaf stock, depending on the type, is a really useful way to uh, save yourself a lot of headaches in the long run. Uh, sometimes I'll add uh, stem plants just because. Uh, I'm going to take them out as the tank matures. Yeah, just so that they're pooling from the water yeah. column, pooling from the substrate, and maintaining a balance. I find that it's uh, one of the best ways to uh, not have like, bad algae outbreaks. Oh, that looks beautiful. So that's a, the panther... The cryptocurrine? Yeah. It's been growing low tech, so its leaves have lost some of the, the pinkness. Yo, you shaded. can see the pinkness pretty clearly. It gets, yeah. I mean, this, so this is really intense. When this light comes on, you'll see it. it's really... It's super pink. But I find that when it's uh, shaded and low tech, it loses some of the pinkness. Ricky would know more than me because he's like the plant god. <laughs> I more, more of the training. Another thing I do when I'm planting is kind of highlight certain areas. So you notice here I'm kind of putting this linear along this piece right here because I want to highlight this piece of wood. And then the contrast with the brown and the green, you know, red and green are opposite each other on the color wheel. So uh, that really adds a lot. Uh, to uh, you know, just make your eye go wherever you, know, uh, you decide that you want the person to look. And it also helps with uh, highlighting shadows. And I really like this. What is this, Nana? That's yeah. another. Do you want things pulled out of rock wool? Yeah, yeah. Are you gonna do it? Yeah, I'll do it. You bring me the bucket, and I'll do it. I got TC's uh, thing I don't know if I'm going to use all of these though. Do you want the roots trimmed? Yes, please. Alright, so this is the yeah, Nana. Can you go ahead and take it? So, uh, yeah, it's a good shade plant, so I'm going to stick this back here in some shade. Is it lights? He's throwing shade. He's throwing shade. Wow, what a cool thing. That's the golden coin. The golden coin. Yeah. It's so yeah. cool. I love it's a nana. Shade. When you put it under brighter light, it should get a little better. Oh, yeah? Let me show it here. Is this Bartera? Or is this. It's like, yeah, uh, yeah, it's Bartera. I'm not going to use it, actually. Okay. Actually, yes, I am. I'm going to use a couple. All right. All right. Yeah. I'm going to put that there to hide the corner there where I put that polyfill. I may have few skills in life, but plant prepper I can do. That little plant prepper. <laughs> All right, so I'm setting a little mini Christmas moss. And with the grate on it, looks pretty cool. It has a little mesh on it, and it'll grow. Of course, we'll go through all that, cover it all up, but works really well for gluing these mats down. That's pretty moss. This one? Yeah. Yeah, mini Christmas moss is gorgeous. It's one of my favorite mosses in the world. Again, with the moss and just uh, highlighting areas. Like highlight areas, the the spots that would be brightest. Yeah, like um, you know, special like visually. Specific, visual, yeah, exactly. Like the uh, the flowy kind of stuff like this, you know. So I just kind of add add it on the top here, here, there, there. So it'll kind of just uh, highlight that area instead of you um, know just lines it instead of uh, completely covering. I'm just going to put tufts of little bird pear grass around. Is that a Sicularis? This is a Sicularis, yeah. I'm 
And these are just accenting. This isn't like in a carpet or anything like that. It's just try and stop it. Try and stop it. Well, it'll take a long time. This is delightful, Kevin. Thank you for sharing. Oh yeah. Um, you talking about the whiskey? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, it was a gift from one of my uh, students. Just like the. You need to tell um, them to send me gifts. <laughs> so this one's a ranunculus uh, undulatus. Undulatus. What's the common name of that? Do you know? Umbrella. Umbrella. I think it's uh, what do we call it? Uh, Mouse's umbrella or fairy umbrella, something uh, or like that. River butter buttercup, something like that. Yeah, it's not called river buttercup. It gets big. It does. All right. August is just going to be all about me. You want to get maintenance? Just fill so up, much maintenance. What's up? You want to get a filter? Uh, do you want to um, set up the filter real quick first? Oh yeah. 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 Do a whole thing with the filter. Yep. So one of the things that I think our hobby has a whole lot of is filters, and this is John, and John is going to tell you about this particular filter. Let's take it away. So this is the Biomaster. Um, Owasa. Owasa canister. Um, the really cool things about these is it's got the heater that drops right in here. You can get them with or without the heater. You can always add the heater later. Um, the there, um, the temperature gauge sticks out here, so you can always access it and see that it's running. Um, there's also a calibrator, so you can hold this blue piece if it's not running, you know, as hot as it says here as it is in your tank. You hold this blue piece and you turn the black piece here and you can make it run up to six degrees hotter and still read the same temperature. So it can match what, you're, what you want in your tank. So over here, there's, um, check valves once you unlock here and you can pop this off so you leave this hanging you can pull it out to work on it Over so that here. would still be attached to the tubes so this would still be attached to the tubes hanging here and you just pull it out to work on it over here you unlock the primer which is also a pre-filter it's got a carbon I impregnated think foam this is a particularly nice feature that you can change the pre-filter so easily without having to disrupt the entire canister and it makes for maintenance to be way easier. Absolutely. Most people go months without ever having to open up the thing because they can just, you know, access the pre-filter. Another cool thing is it's got a nice, really strong handle. And this has to be up because we don't want people to accidentally lift by the, the clips over here. So this is a fail safe so that you don't make an oopsie. Under here, we also have a stainless steel impeller so it's stainless steel shaft which is going to last a lot longer than the, the ceramics for you and it's magnetic it just drops in right here very easy to access it has this is the middle size there's three sizes this one has five trays if you go up or down a size you add or take away a tray the bottom has the biological it's our helix material uh, it comes from our pond end. We're really big in the pond industry, um, and we, the Germans. Um, it looks almost like to, K1. Yeah, it's got extra surface area to grow all the biologicals. On the largest one, you'll have two trays of those. You'll have three trays of the blue coarse foam. Is that 30 ppi? It is. I think it's 30. Ppi. Sorry, I didn't mean to put you on the spot. That's all right. I think I think we have 30 and we have 20. Yeah, this looks so, like 20. This is fine foam. Oh, that's fine? Yeah. So this one, you only get one fine foam at the top. This is just the media it comes with. But again, it's trays. This is what the bottoms of the trays look like. So you can add different things uh, if you'd like. You can change out the foams. Totally customizable. Another thing that I'm, I really want to highlight for you is that anything blue on a wasa means you can play with it. So it means it's meant to move, uh, does different things. And then at the end here, when you're closing it back up, you can't 
open up the check valves until you lock in the pre filter. Which I love. I think that's which awesome. means which and vice versa. So you can't unlock the pre filter if you're in a rush or something. You just want to check it. You know you can't access this until you unlock it and stop, which is gonna, you know, stop you from accidentally causing a huge mess. Yeah, I was gonna say, what this means is that you can't accidentally have your filter pump all, all over your floor, or you can't accidentally hook your filter back up and, <laughs> and have it pour out the top. Yeah. So that's a really amazing feature for those of us that might like shiny squirrels. Yeah, another great thing is it has a three plus one year warranty, which covers everything. So it's got, uh, that means everything except obviously the filter media, but... So if you buy it with the, the heater rings, included, it covers the heater? The heater has a three-year warranty. Okay. So the three plus one means that you have to register the product online to get that fourth year, but the, it can potentially have a four-year warranty on it. Very cool. Which is very long time. Uh, also very low wattage, so yeah. you can save a lot of money in the long run. I think um, you said this one was something like 16 watts, 16 or the watts, larger yeah. one even, I'm not sure. Yep, 16 watts. It's really not um, that much. Yep. And that's for the filter pump, not the heater, correct? Yes, that's just for the pump. Yep. Okay. The heater that you want to use, by the way, just note that it's also going to have a separate plug for the heater because the heater is sold its own separately. Entity. It's its own piece. Now, yep. while the, the heater is in there, is there an indicator light that shows when it's on or no, off? No indicator light, but the heater does run dry tested. Okay. So you will... I mean, you'll be able to feel the heat okay. um, in the tank. You'll be able to see if it's if it's working or not. But just know that even if this comes out of water, like I took it off, it's still going to be running. It's not going to explode on you, the heater. It's going to just continue to run. So don't touch it. <laughs> Is it recommended to unplug that before you start your filter maintenance? I, I would unplug it. Okay. Yep. Great. Thank you. Yep. No problem. So you're just placing paper towels so none of the substrate gets disrupted? Yeah. Um, this is the part that stresses out Corey. The 450 gallon per hour pump. So it goes fast. Oh yeah. So, this one. so what Corey's doing is just sliding the tubing one over and then you tighten the, the barb fitting. To prevent leaks. Man, good company, good products good people need to all share the knowledge because it benefits everybody. So this is the final result and I think you have to admit it's absolutely stunning and a wonderful example of a nature aquarium. Um, as always, I wanna hear from you guys. Let me know down in the comments what you think about this. Uh, and if you're interested in seeing more videos like this, I do have a lot of opportunity to travel and see a lot of really great presenters as well as fish rooms. And I would love to share more of this with you, but it is a labor of love because this is a lot of work. So make sure you let me know if this is something you'd like to see more of. Thanks to Kevin Kelly and Corey Hopkins.